Today our second speaker is uh, Ernani, and he is going to talk about four-dimensional gradient rich solutions. Thank you, thank you, Mustafa. Thank okay. you, organizers, for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to speak here today. Uh, I'm trying to give a general idea about four-dimensional gradient rich solutions, but uh, to do that, you need to discuss some basic facts before to discuss the specific dimension uh, in on rich solitons. Uh, this is the, the idea of my first talk. I'd like to show some basic notations from Riemann geometry, discuss some uh, the definition of rich solitons and properties. And finally, today I'd like to show the connections between rich solitons and, uh, and the rich flow. Uh, there are many uh, interesting uh, motivations to study this kind of, uh, of manifolds, but the connections with the rich flow as uh, a self-similar solution and singularity models is the most important uh, motivations. So let me start today, discuss some uh, basic facts on Riemann geometry. Uh, before I do that, let me uh, suggest some reference. Uh, a very good reference is the, the book of Hamilton's. Uh, let me write correctly here. Hamilton's Rich Flow is a book brought by Show. Uh, Louis Nee. And a uh, very good reference as well is a paper that you can find in the archive, for example, is a uh, on recent progress on rich solitons. This wrote by I don't saw. It's very nice to, to see uh, maybe of the talk to compare uh, the, the main result that you discussed here and basic fact that you try to, to explain here. So just to begin, let me start with the, some basic notations. Uh, usually, is, uh, they are notations in Geometric canal is not necessarily a uh, rich flow. We use some conventions that comes from the physics uh, 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 techniques. But initially, assume that you have a, a smooth manifold and suppose that JIJ is a, a, a Riemann metric in such given manifold. Then this must be a n dimensional Riemannian manifold. And with this notation, the Christoph symbols are given by uh, gamma ijk equals to one half j k l the derivative in directions i j j l plus the derivative in directions j, j i l minus derivative in direction l, j i j. So let me uh, try to explain uh, the notation here. This is the, the Christoph symbols for the indices i, j, k. And uh, here represents the the, the inverse matrix of JKL. We are looking for the metric as a, as a matrix. And then here are the derivative in the directions of this indices. For example, they are the derivative in, of the metric G, G, GJL. And it's the same for the another. And here, if you look at more carefully, we have some repeat, repeat indices here. For example, we have L here and L here. We have K here. 
uh, have uh, some have Ali here, Ali here. So here we are using uh, um, a very important uh, notation that you call Einstein convention. Let me explain. We are using Einstein convention, which essentially says that we sum over repeat indices. For example, for example, if you have a metric J V L, and if you repeat the indices J I I, this is the trace of the metric. Always we have some, for example, we can also write like this. If you have J, I, L and take J, I, L here, you have a sum in I and J. Do you understand? If you repeat the indices, for example, we have repeat indices here, I have a sum in I and J. This is an Einstein convention just to avoid to use this, this sign of sum. And here we have a sum and L here. Okay, it's fine. Okay. Then this is the Einstein convention uh, of sum over repeat. Let's use it here. Okay. So with this notation, if you assume have this notation, we are able to write the Riemann curvature. Uh, the Riemann curvature we have we have this notation is given by. Uh, R I J K. Let me write like this. Uh, I J K and I J K L. If can be right, I J L K here if you want. This is essentially the derivative of the Christoph symbol plus, sorry, minus the derivative direction of J of gamma I L K plus gamma I P K gamma J K P minus J P K I L P. Okay, then we have a curvature here. And looking more carefully, we have uh, we can write this the Christoph symbols only uh, by consider the metric, the metric uh, uh, value. Then we can write the curvature uh, just looking for the derivative of the the Christoph symbol. Then the Riemann curvature only depends of the metric. Okay, one interesting fact here. Uh, that I'd like to say is that with this uh, this definition, it's not difficult to show that the Riemann curvature is unsymmetric. As follows, it has the following properties. If you have I J K L. And if you replace, for example, these two first indices, we obtain I, J, I, K, L, you can put minus here. Then it's unsymmetric in the first two indices, but it's also unsymmetric in the last two indices. If you have I, J, if you replace L, K, then we also put minus here. However, if you replace the above the the two initial indices with the last two indices 
few replaced at the same time like this. Uh, then the value is the same. We cannot, it's not necessary to change the sign. This is uh, increasing properties of the Riemann curvature. Uh, essentially, this property is called uh, a, a symmetric, unsymmetric property. It's a curvature property for any uh, uh, tensor. If you have a tensor, which has this property, we say that this tensor is a curvature type. It's very common to say it like that. So, moreover, we also have an interesting property, which is called beyond identity, which is essentially a sequel uh, 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 property. For example, if you fix the value of L here, and looking for the IJK, you have some cycle uh, uh, argument like this. If you sum this term and this sequence here is IJK, IJK, if you tend for start in J and J, K, I, and fix at the last one, and the third one will be K. I, J, sorry, K, I, J, the last one is fine, fix it. The sum must be zero. It's a cycle uh, property, it's called beyond identity. This is called the first, first beyond identity. Then the, the Riemann curvature has this, this have this these properties uh, is unsymmetric like this, and also satisfies the behind identity. So uh, from this we are able to now definitely uh, 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 can consider define uh, the Ricci curvature. What means Rich curvature that are your object of our interest uh, in these manicures. The rich curvature is essentially the trace it's defined by the rich, but I can consider in coordinates ij is the trace of the 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 Riemann curvature. Let me put ij k here, and then it will be j j l l i j j l. This this is the inverse matrix of the metric. And then this is essentially to say trace of the Riemann curvature. Then we have the trace of the Riemann curvature. We obtain the, the Ricci curvature. The Ricci curvature is, is, is a two tensor uh, given by the trace of the, the Riemann curvature. Not that uh, our trace is in the second and the last one, in the four of inches. Okay, uh, there are another books that consider the trace in the second and the third one, but for us it's, it's, it's convenient to consider these uh, conventions of tracing. And of course, if you replace the positions K with L, because it's unsymmetric, the sign will be changed, then we need to take care about that. So also interesting fact here, I use an indices, but essentially, when you put two inches like this, IK, essentially what I'm looking for is something like, this is equivalent to say the reach is applied X and Y, okay? This two inches means that this is a two tensor. This means that, okay? This two inches means uh, that the reach equal to is a two tensor and the remake curvature is a four tensors because I'm using four inches. It's just annotations. Uh, it's very common in geometric analysis. And it's more more simple that consider some invariant uh, uh, computations. Uh, also, the scalar curvature can be obtained only taking the trace of the rigid curvature. 
then the trace of the rich curvature we obtain a zero tensor, which means a function becomes a function the final end. Then this is the scalar curvature, which is obtained by the trace of the Ricci curvature. Okay, two inches, the Ricci curvature. Okay, so now we have some uh, interesting notations that you can uh, follow. And uh, one, another uh, formula that comes from this uh, point of view is the second behind identity. Secondly, Bianchi identity. The first Bianchi identity only consider uh, uh, this the, the symmetric property of the Riemann curvature, this cycle IJK, and the second one is looking for the derivative of the the Riemann curvature. If you're looking for IJK L, input here M, and now we fix these two indices and looking for the cycle, but now the cycle go in these directions here. Here I have a sequence M, I, J, then looking for the sequence I, J, M, I, J, M, K, L is fixed. And then next I'm looking for J, M, I, M, I, and then this is also zero. This is another, interesting properties of the Riemann curvature is the second beyond identity. As a consequence of the second beyond identity, we obtain a very useful uh, formula that compare we obtain the the following uh this is the if you take it for j j k nabla k r i j this is, let me translate this essentially what i'm writing here is the trace of the derivative of this guy we have this sum in k okay this is if you if you want, you can do like something like that in the sum in k, because I have two re repeated indices k here. So, but uh, translate here, this is equivalent to say the, the divergence. This is the divergent operator. And in other words, this is trace of the derivatives, the divergence of the operator, rich curvature. Okay. This is just a notation, uh, very common in, in geometric analysis, uh, looking for the, uh, the tensorial notation. And the formula is, let me clean now this, let me clean it here, just let me organize this. This is J, J, K, number K, R, I, J. Then this is the, the divergence of the Ricci curvature and the formula is one half number i r. Uh, another side is, is the scalar curvature. In other words, scalar curvature. In other words, this means that, let me write in blue column here. This means that the divergence of the Ricci curvature is equal to one half of the, the gradient of the scalar curvature. This is known in the literature as the second, the twice contracted second behind identity. Okay, uh, it's a very long name. <laughs> twice contracted second BNT identity. It's a very uh, interesting, this formula. It's very useful. It's very useful. I will use it, it sometimes. So I'm using this indices J, K, and Nabla, K. It's a little, sometimes, and the first time should be a little bit confused for the first travel in this 
in this whole world. But let me prove something just not becomes only uh, on ideas. Let me give an idea of this, the proof of this, this formula here, okay? So let me repeat this formula. The divergence of the rich curvature is one half of R. And let me give a, a proof of this very quickly idea. So let me begin it. We have the second beyond identity formula. It's uh, I, I, J, uh, M, K, L plus number J, sorry, R, J, M, I, K, L equals to zero. Okay, let me start here. And the idea is, it's not difficult, it's just uh, looking for the trace of this equation. When looking for the trace of this equation, let me repeat everything here. I, I K L equals to zero. What 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 can do here? So uh, the metric is parallel. If you take the derivative of the metric, it becomes zero. Then this value here is only this derivative is. In, in the ints m, then I can put this metric inside here, okay? Or uh, in other words, this first term here becomes nabla m j i l r a j k l, okay? But the second one, it's more, uh, it's a little bit different because this term here, the same means I here, repeat here I. Then I have a trace. Uh, then this, this term must be right, something like this, J, I, L. I cannot remove, it cannot put inside of the derivative because this term, when you return, for example, for this, you can see something like that. We have K here and there is I. Then this term is a divergence. This is a divergence operator. Okay, you can keep it. Don't worry about it. Let's look in for another. The last one I can put inside because I have I L and this derivative is, is with respect to J. No problem. I can put inside the derivative. Let me change the, the color here. And this is. J, J I L, uh, M I K L, everything is equals to zero. So what can do here? Here is essentially says trace. However, the trace must be in the second and the fourth of indices. Then I need to replace this position before I take the trace. But when I replace this position, the sign will change by minus. Then I, turn, I, I, I obtain here number M, R, J, K, okay? Uh, the, last, the second one, I keep it, no problem, keep it. And the, the last one, I use the same argument. I have here I and L. And here I can take the trace directly, no problem. Number J, A, M, and K equals to zero. It's not necessary to change the sign because we are in the, the correct position, second and the fourth uh, position that it will choose to be our convention. So uh, what, what can do now? Uh, again, I take another trace. The another trace that you take here is will be J and K. Then I take the trace of everything. Okay, when you do that, let look carefully. Uh, this thing we here, we cannot put inside the derivative because 
this is the same means of this one. Then we obtain a divergence formula. So I just skip it. I just put here MK. But when you're looking for the second one, I can do that because this derivative is with respect to I and here just appear M and K. Then this thing must be right, something like J, I, K, just, just a minute, just, just a minute. Sorry about that, sorry, it's okay. So then we will, let me continue. This guy here, I repeat the R, number I, and I put inside the MK and R, J, M, K, N. And the last one, uh, I can put inside as well. It's J, M, K, M, K equals to zero. So, what I obtain here is this term is a divergence formula, okay? Here, what can you do? You can take the trace. However, you need to replace the position of this indice here, then, then the sign you change. Or in another words, I have minus mk, nabla m, and jk, minus, uh, J I L number I R and J L because I need to change the sign. And the last one here is the trace of the rich curvature. And the trace of the rich curvature is the scalar curvature. Then I have here uh, twice the same, the same thing. If you replace M by I and um, M by I and k by l, we will obtain the same thing. The, here is twice the divergence of the Ricci curvature. And here is, here is the derivative of the, the scalar curvature. Then we obtain the formula that you, that you announce. OK? This is just an idea of the proof just to to show how we can uh, play with this inches uh, above and behind. <laughs> it's, uh, just to give you a, a flavor of the proof, okay? So let's, let's continue. Let's go to uh, some other definitions and notations that you, will be necessary for the next lectures. So, if you have some questions, please uh, feel free to ask me. Let me show more related notation. Uh, it's very common in the study of uh, canonical metrics, uh, rich soliton Einstein metrics, quasi Einstein metrics, critical metrics, uh, looking for uh, smooth map measure space. Why this is, is convenient is because when we can associate a, a potential function. Uh, in other words, this is a smooth metric measure space, which essentially is a, a Riemannian Riemann manifold together with uh, a function together uh, we have a function on M and such that uh, and uh, TV is a volume element induced induced by, by the metric.
Okay. This is a smooth magical measuring space. Uh, it's uh, and you can also denote this by CB. Essentially, we are looking for a Riemannian manifold and uh, a function and a, a volume modified volume element given by this. It's a weight volume. It's very common to say this is uh, a weighted. Okay, so let me put element volume because I put dv the weighted volume form. So why this is interesting? Because this is also related to uh, another uh, tensor that's called Amy Becquery. Uh, usually we, we, we put Emery again first. Emery Becquery Ricci curvature tensor. What means that is essentially looking for Ricci with this F behind and above with the a modification of the Ricci curvature by a function F and this tensorial term. This is the modified uh, Ricci curvature is knowing an uh, Amy Becquery Ricci curvature tensor, or what is we are looking for uh, the a non trivial function. It's not only a, a manifold in a metric, but it's also necessary the existence of a smooth function. Here, M is a, is a positive number. Uh, it's not, let me put in a positive K. Is a it's a positive constant. And why this is, uh, and let me also explain what this, and this guy here, this tensorial uh, value here is, is essentially uh, when you apply, for example, for X, Y, this is the, the Nabla F inter, uh, X and nabla F, the gradient of the potential function in a Y. This is, of course, is symmetric. So this, this tensor is a natural generalization of the, the, the rigid tensor. And uh, it's interesting because this guy is related to another very interesting uh, uh, canonical matrix. As for example, scala uh, uh, the vacuum static space, uh, quasi Einstein metrics, warp product metrics. Uh, this tensor is uh, quite interesting. One special case of this guy is when M is M goes to infinity. Because this thing, if M goes to infinity, is equivalent to say, and of course, we are really a little bit uh, wholly speaking, is equivalent to say this term disappear. Okay? But when you do that, we obtain that we call the infinite Becquery Emery Ridge tensor. Of course, the of course the infinite here is just to just an notation, okay? But is given by rich F, which is essentially rich plus Hessian of F. There's a modification of the, of the rich capital as well, but only consider one term more, which is given by the Hessian of the potential function. In general, what, what, what do we say that is in general, if there's, the existence of this potential function uh, can replace the, the, the geometry of a given manifold. For example, if you have a manifold such that the Ricci curvature is constant, which we said this manifold is Einstein. However, if you assume that this 
rich F tensor is constant, this is not necessarily Einstein. Then the, the class of manifolds which satisfies these equations equals to a constant is bigger than the, the, the set of manifolds such that the rich character is constant. I will give some examples in a few minutes, but before I do that, let me so also say that this tensor is it's also related a very interesting operator, which is given is called drifted drifted Laplace. which is given by the Laplacian F, which is essentially Laplacian minus, minus Nabla F, Nabla 8. Uh, we can, let me show how this play. For example, if we have U a function on M, then this guy, the Laplacian F of U is Laplacian U minus the gradient of F in a the, the gradient of you. This is how this is. This works. And, and the point of the, the analytical point of view, we are putting a, a first order term in, a, in this operator, if, 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 which is our second order operator because the Laplacian is a second order operator. We are putting a, a, a first order operator in this, in this, in, in this uh, approach. In particular, with this, we are able, it's not difficult to show that this Laplacian F is self, is a self adjoint operator in this space. In the space of the square integrable function. And that is L2 uh, exponential minus F. Okay. In other words, uh, if you have u and v uh, functions on, say, infinite m, then it's possible to show that the integral over m of u Laplace and f uh, v with respect to this measure here is equal to minus the integral of the gradient of u, the gradient of v, minus F TV. okay? This is a, a divergence uh, uh, for us identity, the, the green identity. So it's very useful to consider some measure like that in canonical matrix. I will try to show some applications uh, later, but you, when you're looking, for example, the paper of uh, uh, about the 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 Poincaré conjecture, it's it's you can see many times this with this notations will be uh, will simplify some proofs. So turning back to the Amy Becker Rich tensor, okay, just to explain the connections between these guys in the Rich curvature, let me show an interesting. I, I I'm considered. In my point of view, this is very, very interesting fact. When you're looking, for example, for remaining manifolds, let me consider here, complete remaining manifolds of dimension N, such that the rich curvature is bigger than a constant positive constant it for example if the rich curvature is 
is is non negative and also non negative but strictly positive in in this value a yeah? we know uh from the curse of Riemann geometry that we can apply the bonnet myers theorem the bonnet myers theorem and conclude that m is must be compact okay this compactness theorem by Bonnet Myers, if the rigid curvature is, is strictly uh, positive. Okay. So, but if you looking, for example, the same kind of matrix, but now we assume that the rich F, remember that the rich F tensor is rich plus Hessian F. And then assume the same thing. Assume that's happened, we have A strictly positive. Then now you assume that F is a non-trivial. What means non-trivial? It means that F is non-constant because if F is constant, we'll turn back to the first case, okay? Then assume F is non-trivial, non-constant. When this happened, it's natural to ask if the same result holds. This is my question. It's possible to prove that if you ask, if you only put this term more and there's result, the result becomes the same. And the answer is no. This is not true. This is not true. The existence of this function becomes the, the, the result different. Why? For example, I can consider the Euclidean space with standard metric, the standard metric, the flat metric, and taking, for example, a function to be uh, the norm of the position factory divided by four. And under these conditions, R becomes one half, which is a, of course strictly positive. Of in the of course this guy is non-compact. This is a counterexample for this second fact. And then, if you assume the existence of this function, the geometry becomes different. Okay, but if you assume the case of the rich curvature is strictly positive, and if you assume that the the rich F is still positive. We know that there are different results. What means if you assume now, if the rich F M is different now, assume that the rich F M, which becomes rich plus Hessian F minus one divided by M and the F, the F. And this guy is bigger than equals to AJ with strictly positive. And here, assume that M is finite. Of course, cannot be the second case. Okay. When you do that, my answer, my, my question is the same. It's possible to show that M is necessarily compact. This is the, the question. Okay, when you look in here, in the first case is true, the second one is no, the third one must be yes. So how, why this is true? Why this is true? This is a theorem proved by Kian, and uh, if my Memory is, is working fine, is 19, oh, I, I wrote here, 1997. And he proved that if this tensor hit F, M is the back parameter tensor is strictly positive like this, then set manifold must be compact. Then it's a like bonnet minus theorem, but this term is strongly necessary. It's different from this another guy. Then we can see that uh, although these equations are similar, these things are very similar, 
they are different in the geometric point of view. The existence of a potential function change the geometry a lot. Okay. So let me continue. If you have any question, um, feel free to ask me anytime. Okay. So essentially, I discuss uh, the first special case of canonical metrics. But let me put here the definition more properly because we need to discuss on this many times. Let me show the definition of Einstein manifold. I already said a few words about that, but we say that a remaining manifold is Einstein. And here, let me just keep putting here information. I mean, assume the dimension is bigger than three is Einstein if the rich curvature is proportional to the metric by a constant lambda. If this happened, we say that such manifold is Einstein. Uh, of course, this name comes from the, 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 the relativity, the general relativity theory. Uh, they are solutions of the Einstein equations in general relativity. And also they come from a critical points of the scalar curvature functional, which also uh, knowing the literature Einstein Hilbert functional. This uh, there are many uh, results in the in, in the, the classical books about Riemann geometry that says that uh, Einstein metric are the best one on a given manifold. The look and for Einstein metric is an object of great interest in geometry because we know that any, any, any smooth manifold admit uh, a metric, in fact, infinite metrics, but it's natural to look for the best metric on a given manifold. And we know that the best is relative uh, sometimes what the best for me is not the best for Mustafa or another guy, <laughs> but the best here in the, in the, in the sense of Einstein metric is the, is the best and because you have some important symmetries. And so there is a very interesting book about Einstein manifolds wrote by Arthur Bessie in the group of Francis uh, geometry. It's a very good reference about this, 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 Einstein manifolds. So this, this manifold are very important as I want to, to put this uh, uh, clear, okay? Uh, this equation can be right um, very simple way. For example, if we take the trace of the rich curvature, we obtain the scalar curvature. We were, well, I already know that. If you take the trace of the metric, it becomes the dimension. Then essentially you can, show that the lambda must be always r divided by n, and then it's much more common looking for the Einstein equation uh, in, this, in this way, okay? It's much more common defined Einstein metrics to be, to be a remaining manifold such that this equation holds. Of course, it, they are equivalent. And then the sign of the, the scalar curvature provides a sign on the value of lambda, okay? Uh, every geometry afraid to work in the amp sets. <laughs> it's, then we need to discuss examples. Without examples, it's very difficult to do geometry. <laughs> but the first example is the round sphere. Is an Einstein metric. Another example is the Euclidean space. We have also the standard metric or the complex projective space. Let me put here dimension, dimension complex dimension two, just to be more specifically. If the Fubini study metric is another example, and there are many others. But also, there are infinite many manifolds 
that do not add image asymmetric. They are asymmetric is a special property. This, uh, the, the, the existence of infinite many manifolds that do not add image asymmetric was proved by Claude Lebrun and very interesting uh, results. So asymmetric is very special uh, in many ways. Da? So, and uh, in our context here, rich solitons are natural, natural, sorry. A natural genesis of Einstein manifolds. Of course, this is not the main motivation, but is also one motivation to consider rich solitons. Why? Because Einstein matrix is equivalent to say that the rich equivalent is proportional to the metric, and the rich solitons will become that manifold such that the rich F tensor, this guy here. Is proportional to the metric. But these equations will appear later as a inside of the Ritchie flow. But let me now introduce the main definition of this, this lecture. What means Ritchie soliton? We say that, uh, and here let me put first the gradient case. We say that a complete remaining manifold MG is called gradient which is soliton. If that exists, I move function f m satisfying the equation hit F, which becomes rate plus Hessian F proportional to the metric, okay? So the lambda is a, is a constant. Okay. This is the, the definition of rate is solid. Let me post a, a gradient rate is solid on. In a few words, is it means that is a remaining manifold together with a potential function such that the rich curvature plus the Hessian of f is proportional to the metric by a constant. Okay, in short, short way is is this. Then this is my equation of rich soliton. Okay. I uh, will show how this equation appears inside the rich flow in a few minutes. But before I do that, we have the first motivations, which comes from the Einstein uh, manifolds. Because if clearly, if this term vanishes, we have an Einstein metric. In other words, any Einstein metric is a trivial example of rich solid. I'm trivial, not because it's easy, but trivial in the sense that the potential function can be choose to be constant, okay? Then uh, uh, rich solitum are natural generalization of Einstein matrix. And you will know that the existence of this potential function change the geometry as I give uh, uh, a general idea uh, uh, in a few minutes uh, ago. So 
This kind of rich solitons is also uh, divine in three cases. When lambda is positive, we say this guy is shrinking. When lambda is zero, we say that this is that. And if lambda is negative, we say this guy is expanding. This name comes from the geometric point of view of this rich solitons inside of the rich flow. I will give some ideas uh, later, okay? Another, uh, it's very common also in this case, taking a scaling of the metric and assume that lambda is equals to one half, always, just to, to take a normalization. Here is the same, when expanding, we take a normalization of lambda to be minus one half. Then without laws of generality, we may take an scale of the metric and consider lambda to be one half and lambda to be minus one half in this buff case. There is a more general version of this equation, the rich curvature plus Hessian F equals to lambda D. When you consider, for example, let me show the, the motivation. Eh? If you assume, if you take the, 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 the lead derivative of vector fields, any vector field X in directions I, J, for example, you know that this is given by I, J, X, J plus nabla, sorry, I, J, nabla, I, J, X. This is given by this. Then if X is a gradient vector field, this is equivalent to write to nabla F, J here, I, J, and this term becomes uh, nabla i nabla f i j plus i i nabla a j x. Sorry, nabla f. So, but this is the Hessian of f with respect to i and j, and this one is the ratio of f respect to J, I, but the Hessian is symmetric operator. Then this is twice the Hessian F, I, J. So if you uh, forget this I, J, this is holds for any I, J, I, J is arbitrary. Then this is equivalent to say that the delivery chief divided by one half the metric is equals to the Hessian of F. So this uh, allows to assume that we can replace nabla f here by uh, any vector field x. In other words, the rich solid equation can be right something like that, the rich curvature plus one half, the derivative of any vector field equals to lambda t. Then the rich solid is a remaining manifold together with a vector field X such that this equation holds. In particular, if this vector field is gradient, vector field is a gradient of potential function, I will return to the case of gradient rich soliton with this equation. Okay, just to explain that we also have a more general version of this equation. Okay, this is a pure rich soliton. Uh, some guys call pure rich solitons when X is a, a non gradient vector field. Any question? No. Okay. So, how, but let me explain now the relations between rich solitons and the rich flow. Uh, the rich flow becomes very famous in the beginning of the the century, the last century. Uh, since 1982, when Hamilton introduced the rich flow, rich flow becomes very famous. And uh, 
the the ratio flow is given by this evolution equation of the metric it's minus twice the Ricci curvature twice the Ricci curvature with respect to the metric with dt we have some initial metric okay this is the Ricci flow the idea of the Ricci flow it's it's very interesting why so this term in the left right side, if you look in harmonic coordinates, is essential as the Laplacian of the metric, as the Laplacian of the metric. And then this equation is, is quite uh, uh, connected to the heat equation. Remember that the heat equation is, is a guy, is the Laplacian on the right hand side. So the idea of the heat equations is to uh, take an uh, uniformization of the temperature. You're looking for changing the temperature in a, in a body and you want to take some uniformization. The idea of the, the, the rich flow is the same. The idea of the flow, the rich flow, is looking for a uniformization results. And the idea is trying to obtain uniformization of the curvature. It's a deformation process. The idea is, is looking for, for example, if you assume a metric and the initial metric on a given manifold, something like M to not. The idea in this process of the Ricci flow is to looking for this one parameter family of metrics and a curve of metrics. And they form this manifold in such a way that the curvature becomes more round. This is the general idea. Okay, of course, we can. Uh, sorry, let me put this. This is one. This is one idea of the, the rich flow. It's a process that one parent family of metrics are looking for for this change around the, 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 the flow. This is, let me put this a little bit small because I, the idea is change the volume. Okay. This is a general idea of the rich flow. It's a process when you fix the manifold in looking for the space of matrix G on M such that G is Riemannian metric and looking for a deformation of a manifold in such a way that I will obtain a constant curvature. Uh, the topological point of view, they, they are the same manifolds. This manifold is exactly the topological point of view the same, however, when looking for the curvature, the process will be changing the curvature. Let me show one idea how this deformation process holds. And then I will show how Richard sort of appear inside. But just to be more uh, uh, specifically, look at that. When looking for the, this, this draw, we can see that for example, if you have a manifold like this, if you want to obtain constant curvature in some piece of this manifold, it's natural to think that he, he becomes more round. Here, I also becomes more round. However, here, I can develop a neck. If you continue, it's something like I, this guy becomes more round, this guy becomes more round, and this neck becomes more lean, more, more slim, and converts to a line. Then in these situations, we says that we obtain a singularity. Of course, this neck becomes a line, but the process can be different. This is an is a example of a singularity that can happen in, the, in, the, in this process 
of the rich flow. Okay, just to give an idea, but they we have another singularity types that we will also explain uh, maybe in the next lecture. So let me show some special solutions of the rich flow. Again, the, the rich flow becomes very famous uh, also because it was used to prove the Poincaré conjecture by, by Grisha Perriman, also used to prove the one quarter uh, uh, pinching conjecture by Brando and Hitchhain. So there are other important uh, theorems in geometry that was uh, proved by using the rich flow. And this becomes a very uh, interesting uh, object of interest in the last years by many geometries and topologies in, around the world. So the first example of a special solution is, uh, let, me, let me put here the equations, just the, the equation just to be more clear. JT is minus twice the rich curvature with respect to T and uh, the not metric, initial metric. Okay. So the, the, a simple example is when you looking for a rich flat metric. Because if my initial metric is rich flat metric, this term disappear. Then in this case, we says that the solution becomes a stationary solution because I, I start with a, a rich flat metric, then along this process, nothing change. Then in other words, any rich flat metric is stationary solution. Nothing change if you start with a rich flat metric because this term that we are interested in the right hand side becomes zero. And then we can consider, for example, the Euclidean space, a cartridge surface, a calabial metric, a cartridge surface with calabial metric, or a flat torus. If you put these guys inside of the rich flow, nothing change. However, if you start the flow with an Einstein metric, suppose I start the flow with an Einstein metric, which is not is an Einstein metric. In other words, the rich curvature becomes proportional to the metric. Let me write something like this. Let me write in these notations. Rij, with respect to the initial metric, is equal to one half j i j. And here, one half is the scalar curvature, okay? Just, just to be clear. Of course, normalized. No? And just to, to consider this case. In particular, this, this equivalent to say that the scalar curvature is positive no? because I, I'm putting here one half. If I start the, 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 the rich flow with initial metric Einstein, with positive scalar curvature, essentially what happens is I have one family, one pattern family of metrics, which becomes the deformation of the G naught around a scalar factory. If you take the derivative of this term, I have the derivative of this side, but we know that by the rich flow equation, this is minus the rich curvature with respect to the metrical T, okay? And this is lambda linear T, T naught. But we know that around this guy, to, to this metric DT around T to be Riemannian, this guy must be positive. However, we know that the rich curvature, when you have a modification of the metric by a positive value is the same. The rich curvature here is exactly the same of the rich knot. But for 
assumption and start with a Einstein metric, one half T naught. Then this guy is minus, uh, of course, one half, one half here, cancel with this two, and then becomes one T naught. In other words, if you combine this with this, I have that sigma line T T naught is equals to minus one half, oh, sorry, one half cancel becomes just one. And this guy cancel with this, and this becomes just T naught. Oh, but the metric is not degenerate, then sigma line T becomes uh, minus one, then we can write this, solve this, and says sigma T is one minus T, okay? Why this is, is why this constant must be one? Because when you're looking for D naught here of this side, I'd like to recover D naught, then sigma zero must be one. When you return to this equation, we have this guy, our solution of the rich flow becomes one minus T T naught. This is the evolution of the metric around of the rich flow. When we start with an Einstein metric with positive scalar curvature. Look at that. If we know that T is the time, okay, T is the time. And, and when the time is becomes one, G1 becomes zero. We degenerate the metric, okay? Uh, in other words, around this value, if you assume T is equals to zero, I return for the initial metric. And if you assume T equals to one half, I obtain T one half is one half up to naught. Is a scaling of the metric. In, in other words, I'm changing the volume of the metric. This process here tells us that I start with uh, isometric with positive scalar curvature, and the most simple example is a round sphere, of course. Round sphere is an example of uh, isometric with positive scalar curvature. There is a initial metric. And around the process, I change the volume. The, the volume becomes small, is one half. And continue this process, it converts. Let me, let me change a little bit more to be more clear. Becomes small and then becomes small for a point. Okay. It's clear. In other words, around this, along this, this process of the rich flow, we will develop a singularity in a finite time. In the time equals to one, the finite time, I obtain a, a singularity around the rich flow. And we say that I will obtain a singularity. Right, we obtain a singularity in a finite time. Then we well, I already know that in the Euclidean space, the, the Euclidean space, we know that the rich flow not, nothing tends. But if you're starting a round sphere around the rich flow, it's develop a singularity that a singularity in finite time becomes small, becomes up, goes to a point. Okay. And another factor interesting is around that, uh, remember the scalar curvature of a round sphere depends on the radius of the sphere. The scalar the, the curvature is one divided by the scalar curve, the, the radius square is 
the the scalar curvature the scalar, the, the curvature is one divided by the hydro square. Then our, our, along this process, the hydro goes to to zero. In another word, the curvature goes to infinity. In this point, we obtain we says that it's a blow up of the curvature. It's a blow up. It's a blow up of the curvature. The hydrus goes to zero and the curvature goes to infinity. Okay. In fact, the scalar curvature goes to infinity, like one divided by the time remaining, because the time remaining is in this case, for example, the 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 metric is will be zero in t equals to one. Then this the capital T is the maximum time that the Ricci flow exists. Then the scalar curvature goes to infinity, like you one uh, divided by this maximal time minus t as t goes to the maximal time. This is the case that it says we have a blow up in the curvature. Okay. By contrast, if you now looking for the case of Einstein matrix with negative scalar curvature, the result becomes different. For example, we, we know that the, the Euclidean space, nothing changed the flow. The round sphere goes to a point and develops singularities and the curvature blows up. But if you assume, for example, I have an Einstein metric, but now with the initial metric proportional to the metric, the initial reach, the, the initial metric said that the rich curvature is proportional to the metric, but with negative guy here, negative theorem. In other words, if the I have an Einstein metric with negative scalar curvature. We can repeat this argument that I did and obtain that the metric must be something like this, one plus T, the initial metric. In other words, here becomes plus, and then the metric JIT, is this for all time. And, and moreover, what I'm doing here is take, I'm expanding off the manifold. Remember in the sphere, I have the sphere shrink to a point, but here with this plus here, when I change the time, when you go to a positive time, we get a expanding manifold. For example, if you start a hyperbolic space, Space, the GS inside of the flow, we obtain a bigger one. If you turn the time, it will be a bigger, 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 bigger one, hyperbolic space. And in other words, the, the metric exists and is spanned homothetically for all time. In this case, uh, the evolving metric. Exist and spans homothetically for all time. Uh, Look at that. In the, in the case of the Euclidean space, I have a, a statical case, not, nothing turned. In the, in the case of the round sphere, I have a shrink to a point. In the case of a hyperbolic space, I have something like expanding. It's exactly the reason that you consider which is solid to be shrink, stead, and span. Of course, we have no time to, to explain now the connections, but in the next lecture, I will show exactly how we reach a sort of P inside the flow with this, this motivation. I think we can stop now. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for nice 
uh, intuitive explanations. Any question? All right. Um, thank you very much again.